how will we solve our future technical problems when we can't even begin to imagine what they might be? In systems engineering, we call these sorts of things unknown unknowns. There are things that we don't know that we don't know, which makes them difficult to explore. Some of the most terrifying challenges ahead will arise from these unknown unknowns. They're lurking under the bed and probably watching us with their beady little eyes while we don't even know to look there. How are we going to solve the problem when we don't even know to ask the question? All technology currently and in the future are, is proposed of socio-technical systems. The socio-technical system is comprised of hardware, software, and people in varying levels, individual operators, maintainers, support personnel, organizations with, which are working with the system, and the culture in which that system works. From my perspective as a systems engineer and a cognitive psychologist, I have to wonder how we can go about making these designs for our socio-technical systems better. In addition to that, these systems increasingly exhibit dynamical properties, and those dynamical properties arise not only in the individual components, but also in the concatenation of those components as a solution. A dynamical system can lead to unpredictable outcomes, and these are known as emergent modes. Now you can have an emergent feature, and that would be great. Something that happens and you think, oh wow, I wish we'd thought of doing that. Of course we did, let's sell that. Uh, but you can also have emergent failure, which is when the system fails and you don't know why, and you didn't even know to expect that kind of a failure. We need to ensure that we design to assure human control authority over these systems, especially as they become more autonomous. We have problems to solve. We have solutions to develop. We need to solve problems rather than sell solutions. Emergent failure modes have been exhibited and they can operate in a number of ways. If you recall the Super Bowl of 2013, 70,000 people in the stadium, 110 million people watching on television worldwide, and half the lights go out. It took over half an hour to fix that, partly because nothing was broken. A setting had been set, and that caused the system to go into a mode in which half the lights went out, potentially putting 70,000 people in danger. In the air traffic control system in 2014, a maintenance activity caused the entire system to come down and backed up air traffic for a couple of days. And if you recall in our self-driving car testing recently, a pedestrian was killed because no one told the car that sometimes people don't walk in the crosswalk and sometimes people push bicycles. The car did not know and we had a fatality. So how will we solve all of our big problems? Because we know they're coming, we just don't know what they are. Um, and one of the ways to go about that is to ask the right questions. How do we ask the right questions? Well, let's start by knowing two things. One, there are no unpopulated systems. None. Even the most automated of systems has to have somebody start it, has to be maintained, and has to be looked over and looked after. That's the first thing. The second thing is that humans must maintain authority and control over the system at all times because when something goes wrong, it's a person or people that has to fix it. Humans first, technology second, no matter how cool it might be. So how do we go about asking the right questions? Because we can ask a lot of questions, but we need to ask the right questions. We need to create questions that allow us to think systematically about something about which we know nothing. Again, unknown unknowns. We don't know what we're asking about, and we have to go about systematically coming up with a solution. How do you think systematically about something that isn't? Like a failure, an emergent failure mode. It doesn't exist until it, is, until it does because we haven't thought of it. Well, one of the ways to go about asking these right questions is to practice. Practice asking questions. Practice exposing problems. 
practice looking at how things may or may not come out of a system that already exists. We have to open the frame as well when we try to solve problems. And that can come from a variety of ways, including trying to find a diversity of people. We need gray heads, people who have worked on these systems for a very long time. They know a lot because they have faced a lot of problems already. We need shiny new people who are full of new knowledge, but perhaps lack experience. And then we need all the people in between on those two continuums of information and experience to bring together all of their knowledge and experience and try to come up with new potential solutions. We also need to bring diverse thinking. For example, if somebody brings a car in to be repaired after an accident, often what happens is somebody just goes in there and starts bending metal and bring it back to where it was. But what if instead we thought about the problem this way? How did the accident come to happen? What occurred and resulted in this outcome? So we've just turned the question around on its head. We're looking for diversity, flexibility, and resilience, all of which help us come up with new possibilities. You were born creative. All of us were born creative. And then later, we learned not to be. So that would suggest that it is not too late. We know from our experience working with engineers and creatives that creativity can be trained back in. We also know that our brains are always working to create new connections. Every time you learn something, you build a new connection. And so it's not too late to work on your own creativity. You have to practice using all of these activities, whether they are specific techniques, tools, or processes. And imagine what you could come up with if you worked at being a little bit more creative. So again, how do we ask the right questions? Well, we want to apply creativity and flexibility to our problem space. And we want to use it to generate problems, generate potential solutions, and eventually to evaluate those solutions as well. We want to encourage polymathism in all people. I'm not so sure poly polymathism is a real word, but we want people to be as good at they can, as they can be at as many different things as they can be. So for instance, you might be quite good at using all the features of your mobile phone, and you might be quite good at scrambling an egg. I could not figure out how to turn my phone on, but I do know how to whip around a lawnmower. So I am also quite good at, um, at uh, changing baby diapers. All of these activities bring us a collection of knowledges and experiences, and the diversity of those allows us to have a much wider field of possible inputs for our solution. So you want to have not just people of varying knowledges and experiences, but also experience and adept at a number of activities. What is creativity? Creativity is turning something new into reality. And so we want to be able to have new solutions, and that's what we're looking for. It's the ability to perceive the world in new ways, to ask new questions, to find hidden patterns, and to make connections, often between seemingly unrelated things, like you're using the mobile phone and my ability to lawn, mow the lawn bring those together to create new pools of options. Now, I've told you that you've learned to be uncreative. How would you stay uncreative? Well, you'd stay in your own head. Don't talk to anybody else, just stay in your own head. Don't learn anything new. You probably know enough anyway. Don't handle ambiguity. Don't even allow ambiguity. We'll just have none of that. Stick with your stagnant processes and be sure to always do things the same way. Same day, no, same stuff, different day. Be sure to stay a one-trick pony. Don't try to learn anything new. And be afraid, be very afraid of change 
or of anything different. And if you want to make it stick, lather, rinse, repeat. Because non-creative behavior is learned, we know that creative behavior can be retrained as well. And we've done some of this work with engineers and with artists. Um, creativity can be taught. We want to help people learn the importance of returning to the things they did as children. Explore, experiment, poke, find out what happens, challenge all of your assumptions, and imagine and synthesize and try to figure out how to stick new information together in new ways, and how to stick old information to new information, kind of like mixing colors of Play-Doh. We want to be sure that people understand and can work with the tools, techniques, and processes of creativity. It's not just thinking. There are ways to enhance that. What are the bridges to creativity? If you are creative and you can be working on developing your creativity, one of the things you can do is to just be open. Be open to new ideas. Be open to things that challenge your comfort. And allow yourself to ask the question, what if? Don't be afraid to ask someone else, well, what if we did this? And encourage and coax from them they're also they're what they're thinking. You want to make sure that you stay curious. And perhaps most importantly, do not be afraid to fail. Because failure is a great place to learn. You want to make sure that you let your brain work. Some of the best ideas, this is such almost a trope, some of the best ideas are to think in the shower. That idea you have just as you drift off to sleep. The thought you have as your foot's about to hit the ground when you're running. All of those are places of creativity. You've actually occupied the front part of your brain, if you will, with something else. And so the rest of it is free to run. You also want to embed creativity into everything you do. It's one thing to create an amazing solution to a socio-technical problem, but how about another more social problem? Like, what are you gonna make for lunch? You can be creative in all the areas of your life, and that will help you be creative when you're solving these challenging problems. Creativity can be taught. It can be developed and nurtured. Encourage mind calisthenics and encourage non-rote answers. We want to look for a continued creative processing and to work to always be generating new ideas. Don't worry about what will stick, just generate. So how will we solve our future technical problems when we don't even know what they're going to look like? We'll start with the humans. We'll leverage their inherent flexibility. We'll continue to push them to be as creative as possible. We'll apply that to all facets of daily life, not just to our complicated problems so that we're really good at it. And we'll build creativity in as early as possible, as often as possible, wherever possible, through education, through experience. And I imagine we'll create a solution. <laughs>